Developing Tomorrow's Leaders is a podcast that is all about educating, supporting, and inspiring the next generation of leaders. Your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T, has over 35 years experience of educating, supporting, inspiring, and enhancing the lives of many young men and women. Join Coach T and his village of inspiration. Welcome to Developing Tomorrow's Leaders. I am your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T. And again, we have an amazing guest that is dedicated, committed, and believes in the next generation of leaders. And her work is something that will be both advantageous and beneficial to not only kids, but also parents. She's an award-winning author of books for kids and teens, and some which include the phone book, Stay Safe, Be Smart, and Make the World Better with the Powerful Device in Your Hand, and many others. She blends social science stories and activities in her writing, unpacking tricky stuff that surfaces during childhood and adolescence. She has a master's degree in social sciences and a knack for writing about complex topics in ways that connects with kids and with teens. She regularly contributes to media outlets on content related um, kids, parenting, friendship and social uh, learning topics. Please help me welcome. Jessica Spear to developing tomorrow's leaders. How are you, Jessica? For all the way from Colorado. I am great, Antoine. It's so great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time and I appreciate you coordinating your schedule. And Jessica and I were supposed to speak about a week ago, but I had some unforeseen things come up and she was gracious enough to reschedule. So I greatly appreciate you doing that for me. So oh, my pleasure. So thank you for doing that. So Having said all that good stuff, first thing I want to ask you is, how long have you been writing? Oh, I started writing, gosh, let's see, it was about 15 years ago. Um, and it, it's, you know, I just, it's something I wanted to always get back to. I did lots of things. I've worked for nonprofits. I've, I've taught at colleges. I've done various things. My background is in social sciences. And what got me really writing was being a parent. And, you know, seeing some of the, I've, I've a special interest in relationships and healthy communication and seeing some of the struggles in my kids and other kids, it really inspired me to see if I could put some things out there that would help. Um, my first book actually grew out of a friendship program that I ran in elementary schools. Um, and then I just, just kept going from there because there's there's no shortage of things to talk about when we're talking about you know developing social and emotional skills for, for kids and teens. So I just keep writing on that topic because it's you know, if you think about it, it's so important for our whole life, you know, our relationships with our friends, our relationships maybe with our partners, with our family. So so I like to really hone in on those skills to help kids start to develop those at an earlier age. Yeah, I think that is so important, and especially now in this this era that we're living in now. I mean, we talk about uh, you can say post COVID, but you know, there's still some remnants of it. But I think it's, it's even more important now because kids have unfortunately been disconnected be, because of the lack of social interaction over the probably what two and a half years or so that we're kind of going through this. So I think the work your the books that you're writing, which I want to ask you about next, are also really important. Now, do now I honestly didn't get to read any of them but are they primarily for kids or are there a combination a combination of both for parents and for students I'm writing directly for kids and all of my books um, are really for an age range between like eight and I would say 13. So it's kind of that preteen year where there tends to be a lot of changes in their social and emotional worlds. However, I'll say they're written in a way that parents or caregivers tend to read them too, because it offers a framework for families. You know, it offers some common language and some skills that it's, you know, so parents often either they're preteen or early teen or on their own, read it. And then it gives them some common tools and language so that they can work together when, you know, kids and teens hit the inevitable bumps in the road. Now, I do want to ask you about specific books because I love for because people, I want them to leave here going, that's a book I want to make sure that I get. Uh, so the first one I wanted to ask you about is the phone book. That's um, my most recent one. So the, yeah, the, my most recent book, which just came out um last August is the phone book, a long subtitle, Stay Safe, 
be smart and make the world better with a powerful device in your hand. And I actually wrote this one during the pandemic when my daughters were preteens and I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much I want to talk to my kids about, you know, if as they become digital citizens and get a fully connected device, be it a smartphone or tablet, what are, what are the conversations, you know, that caregivers or adults would want to have with preteens, early teens on how to use your phone as a force for good. Uh, but it's written in a fun way. You know, there's quizzes and there's there's secret codes to crack and there's a lot of fun facts and a lot of positive stories. So I think it's important, you know, for us as adults to not always, you know, take the negative side as when technology, because technology provides some really amazing tools to us. So, so it's a balance of that. It's a balance of the positives, but also some clear understanding of things that kids and teens should know to help them stay safe and build healthy habits online. So I talk about stranger danger. I talk about cyberbullying, um, you know, f FOMO, which is fear of missing out and social media and the things that, you know, it's really important for, for kids and teens to be aware of as they are becoming digital citizens. Yeah, no, I think that is great. And I think you're absolutely right. Is uh, It can be a, a, an instrument for good. But I also like the fact that, you know, we as, a, as adults, like you are a parent, I, I'm, I'm not a parent, but I'm involved with kids' lives. And I feel like I make a positive impact. But I think there's also the uh, we have to have the understanding that there's something they can teach us, you mm -hmm. know, through this process because they're being born into this technology age where everything that we are learning you know, later in life, they're learning as part of their growth process. So I think them understanding of being responsible early on is truly important. Um, and I think you talk about the stranger danger of uh, the cyber bullying. And then I think there's a, a very sensitive one that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but we know that it is a very prevalent issue when it comes to the digital aspect. And that's how the extortion part or and or sex extortion yes. part where we have kids that are, you know, taking their own lives because of the con the, the because of the processes behind it and how ruthless people can be. And that's why it's so important that kids understand the importance of being responsible and safe with their digital products. Yeah. And just, just so the, the book is filled with little tips of how to change your privacy settings on your phone. Um, Cause where we are right now, the phones often don't come with a default setting or apps don't come with a default setting that are set to the highest to protect kids. You know, so, so I, I want to be sure to include that, you know, teaching kids how to even keep yourself private, how to use um, usernames that don't reflect directly back to who you are as a person or, you know, share your, your personal location. So, so there's little things that, you know, it's important for kids to know. So they aren't targeted by those things. Cause like you said, unfortunately, there's some really bad actors out there, the kids to be aware of that and to set themselves up. So they're as safe, you know, and as private as possible online. So the other thing that, that I, I, I think is really important too when it comes to them learning is involving parents in that process. Mm -hmm. You know, like for instance, your book will outlines, like you say, you have quizzes in there, there's context for them to learn from and then for things for them to apply, but it also has to be reinforced. And, and then sometimes it's tough love reinforcement, sometimes it's supportive, positive reinforcement. So can you share a little bit about how parents can be a part of that process uh, to help kids be responsible and understand the importance of being safe on their, on their devices. Yeah. And so I do recommend, you know, the parents read the book too, you know, especially before they hand their kid a cell phone, because they will learn things too. I've heard, I've been surprised how much I've heard that, that the, the parents learned a lot on how to keep their kids safe online. Um, next step would be come together with your, your kids and your teens to put together some sort of family tech agreement. And this should be collaborative because if we're not realistic, if it's totally top down, you know, it's not gonna last. But if we get together as a family around the table and we talk about like, hey, you know, how can we use these devices in really positive ways, but not in ways that really start to, you know, impact our relationship as a family. So maybe we come together with, there's no screens at, the dinner table you know that's a that's a no screen zone maybe there's no screens in bedrooms you know at night or you know there maybe there's no screens in bedrooms ever you know maybe we always put our phones in the charging stations at this time every day and we put them away um, you know maybe we're not allowed to download new apps without permissions from parents so thinking through a lot of these things that we want to do as a family and 
there's tons of samples online. So if, if family search, you know, family tech agreement, you'll get a lot of ideas and you could put together, pull the ideas that feel like a good fit for your family and start from there. You know, because I always encourage to start with some really clear boundaries and knowing that as your, as your teens age, you're going to change that because they're going to develop responsibilities. They're going to grow in independence. So the, the agreement you put in place when they're 12 or 13 is not going to look the same as the agreement you put in place when they're, you know, 17, 18. So stay flexible. Like you said, stay curious, really listen and learn from them as to how these technologies are influencing and important in their lives. You know, social media is, is the primary way that teens are connecting with their peers now. So we need to understand that, that that is really important but it's also ways to, to coach them and teach them how to communicate on those platforms in healthy versus unhealthy ways, you know, by talking about, you know, cyber bullying and digital drama and, you know, effective communications online. So we can still play a role as, as guides, but we have to understand that, you know, the kids are communicating with each other in different ways than we did when we were growing up. Yeah, so we have to go away, get away from the do as I say, not as I do. We have to, you know, this is what you're saying basically is everybody's got to be on board. And I think you, you're a couple of things you pointed out there are really important is, and something that, that I actually tried based on some conversations I have with kids is a thing I, I called it the digital detox, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you mentioned a couple examples of that is, you know, when you go to bed, your phone goes in one room where the opposite doesn't go in the same room you sleep in. And I say, you know, I'm going to try that because I used to always charge my phone right next to a bed. Now for the last probably four years, I, it's hap I, I don't want the phone next to me. I mean, it's become that part. And when you detach, it totally changes your whole process of how you get yourself geared for bed. Because now every time that phone buzzes, what am I missing? The fear of missing out on something. So I think that, that is a great example of how you can disconnect and realizing there's more to the world than a digital device. And yes, your friends may be a text or um, an email away or a phone call away, but they're, they'll also be there physically the next day in school when you get there. So not uh, basing your entire friendship and relationship through digital devices. And that kind of leads to the other part, uh, part of, that I want to talk to you about, and that's friendships and mm -hmm. the importance of friendships and how kids can understand the importance of not only establishing, but also uh, fostering and maintaining and building strong relationships. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely, you know, where one of my biggest lie is helping kids develop healthy friendship skills, because, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of skills that go into friendships and they develop over time, you know, as, as kids grow in skill and awareness. And because kids are all developing at a different pace, sometimes this is challenging, you know, so some kids are way down the path of really healthy communication, social skills, and some kids are not there yet, or they're on a different path. So it's not surprising that during the preteen, the teen years, there can be a lot of change and maybe, you know, social struggle and social conflict, um, because kids are all developing at a different pace, they all have different skills. That's why I like to really talk about what, you know, what does a healthy friendship look like and feel like? And how can we be a good friend? You know, and who are our friends? You know, what friends are we choosing? So, you know, talking a lot about skills and as well as of, you know, the whole, you know, if we, if we're looking down from above on the friendship scene, you know, just, just some awareness. And I like to, I talk to those about some of the awareness of our social lives as our friendship truths. And I'll, I'll share a couple of these friendship truths, which I share these in my first book, which is called BFF or NRF, not really friends. And that one is specifically for girls, a girl's guide to happy friendships. However, the truths are, you know, for all genders and ages, you know, so, so one of the friendship truths is, you know, friendships have different phases and change over time. And so what I found, you know, working with groups of kids and friendship groups, that, that was a relief to them. You know, it can be, it can be really hard when our friendships change, you know, we, we might start to question ourselves or, you know, just, you know, lose some confidence. Um, but if we look at the course of our lives, our friendships Friendships do have you know change over time, and especially in the preteen years, as kids are changing interests and you know exploring their identities, there tends to be change there. So just knowing that that's normal 
and you know it doesn't feel great it can be really uncomfortable but it is normal and staying open to not knowing what happens in the future you know so now that i've got teens it's really interesting to see that some friendships that might have faded away might circle back or they might you know be teammates now when they were really close friends in elementary school. Now they're teammates and they have a different sort of relationship. So staying open to the changes in friendships is one of the truths that I found really helpful for kids and teens. Another another friendship truth is, you know, everyone develops friendship skills at a different pace. So just knowing that we all have strengths and we all have some room that we can grow in our relationships. And you know, that, again, opens a growth mindset for our relationships that, hey, you know, we're all doing this with the skills we got. And we certainly are not perfect ourselves. You know, the, that book I mentioned, the BFF or NRF, not really friends, has it starts with two quizzes. The first quiz is how healthy are how healthy is this friendship? And then the second quiz is how are my friendship skills? You know, and anybody who takes that quiz is gonna find hey, these are my strengths, and yeah, these are the parts that I struggle with, you know, and maybe it's speaking up, maybe it's cooperating, you know, maybe it's telling the truth. And so, you know, kids will identify, oh, okay. This is maybe how I'm contributing to the, the difficulties in this relationship too. So, so yeah, that's just a little bit about um, that book and ways that we can broaden kids and teens awareness as to all of these skills that go into developing friendships. Is pretty interesting. I, I, I like that. I never really thought about it like that. It's, you know, you know, I understand that, uh, you know, friendships change. We didn't even know that as adults, you know, we ha have, you know, it's more um, acquaintances, really, if you think about it. And I think that why that's important to to talk about is the value that people put on relationships slash friendships slash acquaintances, because there is a gray area with kids sometimes on the level of a friendship. So them understanding the processes of friendships and that they go through stages so they can't second guess themselves if a friendship goes a different way it may not be all them the other person may have evolved in a different way but i also think one of the other parts is who who else is around those kids that helps formulate their understanding of friendships and how they grow and i think that goes back to each individual's different their home life environment is different or the environment away from school besides home all those things come into play and I think the big thing is for kids to believe in themselves and know that they have value. They add value to any friendship that they're in and never second guess what they bring to it is up to the other person to understand and appreciate what they bring. That's just absolutely. my interpretation. Yes, absolutely. Because often in the preteen, early teen years, there's a confidence dip in kids. And that's why these friendship changes can really hit hard. But like you said, if they can realize, you know, that they're OK, you know, they're OK as they are. And these changes and transitions just happen sometimes naturally. And we don't know the end of the story, um, but just not to take that as they're not OK. You know, they are OK. And they're learning. Everyone's learning as we go. Friendships have different phases and change over time and we just keep being ourselves and the per you know the putting our best selves out there um, so so another resource that your listeners can find for free if they search Jessica Spear friendship pyramid um, this friendship pyramid is you know a lot of families just stick it right on their fridge and it it's it's a one page visual of again just this whole dynamic of our social world so so if we picture this at the very tip of the pyramid, is our close friend. So just just a small portion of that pyramid. And and we know as adults that you know these these are pretty special friendships. They're not all of our friendships fall into this category. They're more rare, they're harder to find, they take longer to develop. There's a lot of trust there. There's a really special connection, but they're hard to find. Um, underneath that, I have a huge swath of the pyramid is friends. And I am really liberal with the term friends. You know, sometimes we have online friends or their neighbors or their teammates. And these are the people that we might not know as well. We might not really share as much of our you know, deeper thoughts and emotions. They might not be as comfortable as our 
they're still really important. You know, these people add so much value and joy to our lives. And we have so much to learn from this group. And at the base of the pyramid, our acquaintances, all those people out there that we don't know well at all or know yet. And maybe at some point they might become friends and close friends. And then so running up and down the side of the pyramid is an arrow pointing both directions and change. So what I've seen working with a lot of kids is sometimes we might have an acquaintance that there's a really strong connection that grows into a really close friend. But other times we might have a really close friend where there's a falling out or where there's something that happens that that actually they drop back down to an acquaintance, which feels really weird and awkward, but it happens. You know, it happens to, to everybody at some point in our lives. And so just again, a visual to, you know, just kind of help kids understand this is the lay of the land. Um, we're all growing and changing. We're all learning friendship skills over the course of our lives and stay open to new friendships new people and new friendships because relationships and friends add so much value to our lives um, and, and we have so much to learn and grow in our relationships. Yeah, that friendship pyramid is, is a great idea because it, as you described, you know, people are, uh, I like that there's a saying I, I was taught years ago and that is people come into your life for a reason or for a season. Mm -hmm. And friendship it falls into that because people come in for a season to your point about close friends, friends and acquaintances, you know, and acquaintances be can become friends and they can ultimately become close friends. And that can change over time based on different um, circumstances, if you will. But ultimately, uh, it's about you, how you view that as well, too, because I think the the other thing I'm leading to is that that those two words that have a lot to do with how friendships develop for preteens and teens. And that's peer pressure mm -hmm. because everybody wants to fit in and they feel like, okay, I'm friends with this person, but this person is an acquaintance. How can I make that acquaintance a friend so that we're all friends? That's added pressure that kids are not equipped to deal with because they don't understand what truly what friendships about and what it takes to, to really uh, nurture those friendships. Yeah. Or, or those acquaintances to become friendships. I'm so glad you said that, Antoine, because that's actually another one of my friendship truths. And again, working with preteens and teens, they want to connect and, and feel a sense of belonging in, in such a huge way. It's, it's part of that phase of life. And we all do, but especially in the preteens. But sometimes it can be hard to find close friends um, because, you know, just just the, the nature of the phase of life and, you know, and the different levels of skills with healthy relationships and finding that right connection. So one of, another one of the friendship truths is friends can be hard to find. So you're just putting that out there that, you know, sometimes it might feel like we don't have a cl really close friend and that doesn't feel really good, but that also is is not uncommon, you know, it, for preteens and teens. And that's why I put so much emphasis on the friends level of the pyramid. There's so much value to these people that, you know, we wouldn't consider them our closest friend, you know, they're not the people that we'd go to in, in dire straits, but there's so much value to them. So, so don't discount those. They're, they're are not perfect, you know, that we don't know each other that well, but but they're they're really important to still have a variety of friends in a variety of groups with a variety of personalities, you know, whether they're teammates or classmates. Um, yeah, because sometimes in the preteen and teen years, close friends can be hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they really can. And, and it is such a big part of their life, especially like you said, for preteens is that peer pressure factor. But I think that also this really ties also into them understanding um, how to select friends. Mm -hmm. And because, uh, again, there's a quote, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that is a big part. And it's, it's a quote. But if you think about it, if parents would make that a mantra for their family, you know, it will make kids think about the people that they're associating with who are acquaintances and then you say hey this is an acquaintance, an acquaintance and this is going to stay an acquaintance because this is not a person that i believe can be a close friend only because you know our values and morals don't align but you couple that with peer pressure that could change how a child views that acquaintance and wants them to become a friend or maybe a close friend only because they want to feel included. So I think it's really important for parents to, to share with their kids, too, that not everybody's meant to be your friend and it's OK for them not to be. Yeah. And you can just, you know, keep them as an acquaintance, be friendly, be kind, but keep them as an acquaintance. And, you know, the friendship truth that I have that, that 
that comes to mind when you say that is our healthiest friendships feel safe and accepting. And when I talk about safe, I talk about emotional safety. Like you feel like you can really be yourself. You can really share what's going on with you. So, so again, that truth is you know, our healthiest friendships feel safe and accepting. And as parents, we can encourage our kids to to think about that, you know, which of your friendships do you feel like you can really be yourself? You know, which ones do you feel like you can really share what you're thinking and feeling? And, and those are those special ones that might be, you know, fall into that close friendship, you know, part of the pyramid. Um, but just keeping an eye out for that, because those are the relationships that really are, are so, so nurturing to us over time. You know, those are, those are the people that we know we really can go to for support. When we, yeah, I like uh, you're one hundred percent right about that, and the um, the family dynamics that kids deal with. Um, I always remind kids that never judge people when you're around them because you don't know what they're going through. Because kids have to they are they are the best actors and actresses in the world because there are a lot of people that hide a lot so that they can fit in and so they can create those friendships, those acquaintances that ultimately become friendships. I mean, I think it, the point I'm trying to get to here is to um, be uh, compassionate yes. and not to force, you know, certain situations to your point about uh, a safe friendship. I mean, as you were saying, I'm saying to myself, the first thing I would ask my child is, could you tell me everything you do with this friend without having to think about it? Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. if they could do that, it's like, hey, that's a good friend. Or if they go, uh, if they have to think about it, that that should be a red flag. You know, yes. that, you know that's not truly a safe uh, friendship from 100%, I should say. And not all of them are. I understand that, too. But it's just one of those things to make kids think. I, I like to always remind uh, kids to create thought-provoking questions to themselves. And that would be one. Hey, can I tell my parents everything I do with this friend? And if it's an emphatic, yes, absolutely. You need to have four more like that around you and I'll never worry about you again yes. because, you know, because those kids are coming from a place of love and where they have moral, morals and values that have been instilled in them early on and been positively reinforced over the years. Yes. And I, and I love it. What you touched on earlier is to, to feel, you know, find compassion that don't and you know you don't have to be their best friend you know but you can be kind and compassionate to those that that don't have those qualities too because you know we know that there's something probably going on in that young person's life you know that that's that's causing them to make certain choices or to behave in a certain way you know there's things going on in their life you know but at the same time you know we can coach our kids that you know that doesn't mean that you need to really cultivate this this friendship in a close way, you know, kind and cautious is, is the terms I like to use. Be kind and cautious. You know, this is, yeah. this is someone, this is a kid that's, you know, maybe got some challenges. So, so honor that and, and, and feel compassion for that, but it's not someone that you have to walk alongside to into situations that, that aren't right for you. Yeah. I was, I, I was debating whether it's going to bring this up, but I think it's a great example, even though it is, is from a, a mature standpoint, but I think it's something that that's relevant to the conversation. Uh, several years ago, I was working with uh, this young man, and uh, when I say young man, he's a man, but uh, he's younger than I. But I just say young man, and we're having a conversation one day, and it got pretty in depth. And he said something to the effect of, "Yeah, well, we're really good friends," and it caught me off guard because I I view him as an acquaintance but he viewed me as a good friend. And my instinctual response was, well, no offense, but we're not friends. And he just lost it because it just totally transformed his understanding of what our relationship was. And I felt bad. I was trying to justify it from my perspective, but I share that to just give an example of how people view their friendships two different ways. So if you don't communicate you never establish where your friendship is or if you truly are aligned. Yes. And you know what? I'm so glad you brought that. Studies show that that is very common for two friends to have a different idea of what's actually that friendship is about. That is really common. One could, like you experienced, think it's very close. And the other one's actually, this is not that close at all. So, so that is a really common dynamic that you came up against and and um yeah a tricky situation because you, you you feel bad about hurting somebody's feelings but you want to be honest about you know your your feelings about the relationship so 
but um, yeah, so this is this is maybe why I love relationships so much because they're yeah. they're they are tricky. I don't want to pretend that they're not tricky. Um, you know, so so navigating them as best we can, as in you know as kind as we can, but also you know staying true to ourselves and who we are and what we're looking for in friendships too. Yeah, absolutely. Because in you make a great point is because I could very easily just agree with him and then he would have this misconception of what it was. And then what if, you know, he started inviting me to all these things and I keep declining. And I'm like, oh, we're not that kind, you know, we don't really, really aren't that close. And then he would have picked up on that. And, and then he would start doubting himself. And I just, like you said, I think it's important to be open, honest, genuine and authentic in your friendships. So those are two words I think are really important to be genuine and authentic. It's okay for people to remain acquaintances or just remain friends you know, we can have a lot of friends i put friendship at a very high level only because of how i was raised and how I was how i understand and what they mean friend the word friend means a lot to me and that's just just how i was uh how it was told to me and based on relationships i've had and i have a lot of acquaintances and i'm and i'm good with that and i told kids the same thing and like you said it's fun and your friendship pyramid is great to have thousands of acquaintances and guess what? The more you interact with acquaintances, there's a better chance they become friends. And the more they become better friends and they become close friends and so on and so forth. But uh, so here's a question for you. There's always this. Uh, ask a question. Somebody asked me, how many close friends do you have? And you said on your pyramid, that's a small section of it. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say a number? Yeah, most people gen genuinely have a, you know, nucleus of close friends and that number is very small mm -hmm. uh so mm -hmm. i'm just i'm just curious what do you research think that number research shows you know for adults it's less than five and some of those five might be family members you know so so you you might have your brother and you might have your best friend and you might have your cousin and you know, so so it's less than five it is small um for for preteens and teens it it depends on on the, the preteen or teen if they happen to be a little more might actually have a, a, a group that they feel all pretty close with, or if they're a little more introverted, they might have one, you know, and, and that's totally fine. So I don't want to put a number and say, do you need to have this many? I think what's wonderful is if there is one, but I don't want to make that, I don't want to scare parents if they feel like they, their, yeah. their teen doesn't because there are times where they feel, they might feel like they don't have that. That's why that's one of the friendship truths that close friends can be hard to find because there's so much transition during these years, there might be a gap. And that's why, you know, we just tapped into the, our friends level of the, the pyramid. You know, we start you know, maybe spending more time with, with people we don't consider as close. Um, but yeah, less than five, it's a small number. Some, you know, might be one or two in that. That is perfectly fine. I think it's important for everybody though, to make sure you're you're cultivating some close friendships, whether they're even with family or friends, um, just to have it. It's important for you to have some people in their lives that they can really go to when they, when they're at, when they need some help and support. So, 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 and it, for kids that could even sometimes be an adult, that is fine. You know, if they, if they have a gap in their friendship, they have a, a close adult that they feel like they can really go to. Um, I feel like this world would be in a better place if everybody felt like they had that person, you know, so, so I'm always, you know, cheering people on to, to see, if, can you find a person like that, um, you know, over time, see if you can develop a relationship with somebody that you feel like this is this is a person I feel like I can really go to in a time of need. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the number I had too. Is five or less is what uh, that's the number that I, I've always believed, and, and I believe it's true. And to your point, uh, having at least one is good. And to your, your point, you don't want to give this misconception that your child should have you know five for sure, or you know ten or whatever. And yeah, and if you ask kids, I mean, you, you know, you, your book, uh, you said it would be epic. BFF, mm -hmm. uh, you know, girls are socially more uh, engaging than guys are. Guys like to, you know, we say less, say more, or do more, say less. But, you know, girls have cliques, and mm -hmm. those cliques to them are friendships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, right. And then those are the ones that kind of go from there. And, and we all know that we go through highs and lows, ebbs and flows, and our lives change, and those, those groups become smaller. But knowing that they can have them, that's the big thing, too, is like, hey, you, you can't have but so many. You don't want to limit 
how many they can have and let them determine that because it's the experiences that they go through with those individuals that helps define who they are and the type of people that they want to surround themselves with. Exactly. And which of your friends are bringing out the best in you, you know, and which do you feel like you can really be yourself with? So, so those are those questions that you mentioned earlier, those kind of inquiring questions, just helping kids think about that. You know, they don't have to categorize their friends or count their friends, but noticing, you know, which of the friends after they spend time together, do they feel really lit up? You know, do they feel energized and, and, and paying attention to that? Because, you know, as we get older in life and maybe they're looking for a romantic relationship or partners, that's really important, you know, to start to look for those ones that do feel, feel supportive and they light you up and, you know, they feel very equal. So, so we're teaching kids how to start to notice that within ourselves. And what that said, that last part you mentioned, I think is really important too, because uh, that kind of leads to the relationship part is when kids are understanding the importance of relationship and you, you described it perfectly. I'd like, you know, I'm just speaking in terms of, I, I believe, I believe a lot of successful marriages begin with great friendships mm -hmm. because you have gone through the highs and lows with people and you've stood by them. They've stood by you and you realize, oh my gosh, this is a person, this is the worst thing ever happened to me, but they're still here. And those are the kind of people that you want to surround yourself with. Um, when you're going through your lowest time, who can you turn to? And if you are turning to a, somebody you thought was your friend, it turns out they end up being an acquaintance because they're not there. And I think to making kids understand the importance of relationships and establishing long term friendships truly defines them as well as the people that they're connected with. Yeah. You know, and, and what's what's so wonderful, you know, that parents can understand is, you know, if if they're their kid or teen is maybe having a hard time in this area, what's happening at home can be so supportive to them. You know, having family dinners, having, you know, conversations where they're feeling very heard and supported. So, so families play a big role in this, you know, so that we can, we can model these things for our kids, even if they're not finding it quite yet out in their own social world, but we as a family can help them feel the love and support that, you know, they eventually will feel as they move out of our nest and, you know, in their relationships, but modeling that at home, you know, the important, I can't even stress the importance of, you know, family dinner studies have shown that if a couple of times a week you can get together as a family, no, no screens, you know, just talking around the dinner table, the ripple effect of that on grades and self-esteem, you know, even drop in teen pregnancy rate, it's huge. So finding those moments at home to just sit down and connect as a family and really get to know each other, you know, and what I like to do at, at our family dinners is just throw out a question, a fun question that we can share and talk about, you know, like, hey, you know, so what was the hardest part of your day today? Or, hey, well, you know, what, what's, you know, what's something you're watching that's interesting this week, you know, so, so something that's just, we're starting to, we're learning about each other continually, you know, learning who we are as people, you know, just, just being there. So, so yeah, the, I, I talk a lot about friendships, but a lot of this, you know, starts, starts in the home. Yeah. And it's about the relationship you have with family because that relationship with family is going to determine what kind of relationships you have outside of family. Mm -hmm. And you want your family should be your first group of friends to start with, and then it should filter out from there. You made me think of a couple of things. I was talking with the kids about how building good relationships with their parents. And your example, there's a perfect one, you know, sitting around the dinner table and, you know, you're asking mom, dad, say, hey, what was the toughest part of high school for you? Yeah. And that question leads to what I like to think would happen is a conversation. And that conversation leads to a strong relationship, which means you're developing a, a, a foundation for your kids to know, oh, Mom, dad went through the same thing I went through. So I feel more comfortable asking. Now they won't rely on their friends who aren't equipped to really give them the answers that they need, the life experiences and the authentic uh, responses to tough times that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And you know, teens are, they have this special radar for authenticity. You know, they, they know when someone's not being straight with them or someone's not being authentic and honest. So, so, you know, the more we as, as, you know, caregivers and coaches and, and parents can share, you know, honestly, authentically, you know, they, they'll appreciate that. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of uh, when you talk about kids know, and then when they, they think they know, but they don't know 
about two years ago, I had a group uh, conversation with about 15 middle school, high school boys and girls. And these are kids that are part of my uh, nonprofit. And we we're sitting asking questions and we we're talking about peer pressure. And I asked them, I said, what do you think the worst thing I've ever done that I'm, you know, that I regret doing? And they couldn't think of anything because they think that I can do no wrong. Right. And I'm saying, and they're like, uh, drinking alcohol when you're underage. I said, no, actually, I didn't drink until I was of age because I didn't care to drink. And they're like, uh, got in a car accident to tell your parents. I was like, no. And I told them I tried drugs once. And the you would have half of them about fell out of their chairs. And I said, exactly. And your reaction is exactly how I felt internally. Uh, you're shocked, but I felt I had so much guilt that I carried for years and years and years. And I say, I tell you that because you know who you are and you should never shy away from who you are, regardless of who you're around or who's trying to encourage you to do whatever. And I never lost any friends because I ultimately decided I'm never doing that again. I still hung around the, around those friends, but I chose not to do the things that they did. And they respected me for it. And I never lost those friendships, but I found out a lot about myself. I don't have to go with the crowd in order to fit in. Yeah, I love that. And I, you know, one of the questions I I ask kids too is, you know, think of, of, of your peer group. Who who do you know that that really truly you know, does what they want to do. Like they, they don't follow the crowd all the time. They're true to themselves. They're true to their interests, you know, and, and once they think of this person, you know, it just dawns on them, wow, this is a person that actually garners a lot of respect because they have the courage to do that. They have the courage to actually be who they are and follow their values. And, and sometimes, you know, kids get lost in the pressure to, to belong or to be in a certain group that they forget that. There's actually people navigating this now that, that are, are doing an amazing job and people respect them because they are doing their own thing. So, so just little conversations like that, you know, remind kids that, that it's okay to do that. It's okay. And, and of course, we're all going to mess up at times, you know, we're all going to make mistakes, but that's our chance to learn and grow when we do make those mistakes absolutely and that's that's what growing up is about it's about life experiences and some are good some aren't good and, and you have to live with them but it's also important to share the ones that don't so that somebody else learns from them so you know that's those are great points um jessica it's been a great 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 conversation really appreciate your energy and love your authenticity as well and your genuine genuine approach and love for what you do and i know there are a lot of parents and young people out there that are benefiting from your books. And I do wish you continued success. And uh, it's a couple of things before we go. I wanted to ask if there's anything, uh, you, are you working on any new books? And if you are, what we can expect? Ooh, I am right now. I'm working. I've got I've got two that I'm working on. One is another book on friendships. My first one was really geared towards girls. Um, and so I'm working on another one that's just not for girls. Um, and then I am working on one that's actually on mindfulness um, because a lot of kids are struggling with anxiety and depression now. And mindfulness is one way, um, a, 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 a something that everybody could do at any time. You know, it doesn't require... Um, you know, a counselor, which can sometimes get acquired medication, but a tool that anybody could use at any time to, to navigate when they're feeling stressed and anxious or depressed. So, so I'm working on a book um, on mindfulness specifically for teens using common things that do really stress out teens and, and youth. Awesome. Well, I know you're going to be cranking that out pretty soon. And I wish you, like I said, I wish you continued success. I, I don't know. I've, I've have one book out. I'm working on my second one, but I'm like, you cranking them out. Like, I don't know. It's just like every other, what, how often do you, how long does it take oh, you to write a book? Well, it, it, and I'm, I'm writing little books, Antoine. My books are short. <laughs> you're writing long there's, books. Hey, they're, they're still books, Jessica. <laughs> they're still books. They still you know, take time. I, I do. I was doing one a year. So I did I three in a row for three years. And now I've had a little break. So I'm like, I'm, re I'm finally getting back to it. Cause that was a lot, but yeah. So yeah. I, I, <laughs> like you though, I've got those ideas my head that I just keep wanting to yeah. delve deeper into. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I totally, I totally understand that. Uh, so yeah, this is great. So again, the next thing I was going to ask is how people can follow you and get access to your books and reach out to you. The easiest place is my website, which is Jessica Spear, S P 
P-E-E-R.com. And that has links off to all my social on, you know, Instagram or Facebook or, you know, Twitter, which is now X. Um, and also links to my books. And my books are available anywhere books are sold. Um, so there's links off to, you know, your favorite booksellers. Um, you might even be able to get them at your local bookstore or your library. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that, that's the easiest way. And I'd love to connect. Feel free to send questions if you have any to my um, contact form on my website. And yeah, it's just a pleasure to chat with you, Antoine. It's so nice to meet like a kindred spirit who is just passionate about the things that I am. No, oh, oh, well, absolutely. My pleasure. And like I said, it, we are what I like to call the village of inspiration for the next generation. And I think it requires more people like yourself uh, to truly make an impact. And, and that's why I want to make sure that our listeners and our viewers get a chance to experience your work and, and go uh, to her website and be sure to get one or all of her books. And when she has the pre-order for her, her new book, when it comes out, be sure to do that too. Uh, so thank you so much, Jessica. One last question for you. And that is if you will share with us the individual or individuals that have been most influential in your life and why. Mm, oh my gosh. <sighs> you know, I, my mom has been incredibly influential. She is always such an incredibly hard worker and has this way of seeing the good in people that I just truly admire. So she, my mom has been extremely influential. And then talking about friends, I have got a, a few close friends that I don't know what I would do without, you know, that our long walks and our long talks, and we've been friends for years and years. And truly, I, I mean that. I don't know you know, where I would be without having these, these friends by my side in everything that I do. Awesome. Yeah. I'd love that mom. Yeah. Then I always say there's no answer I'm looking for. I just like for our listeners and viewers to understand that there are many people that influence our lives and our directions and lives and our trajectory in life and have the lasting impact. Some are early in life, some are later in life, some are throughout our lives. And your mom obviously is one throughout your life. And, um, and of course, you reference your friends, which is what this this uh, in talk interview was mostly about is the friendships and the values of those. So, again, thank you. So before we go, Jessica, I want to share with our listeners and viewers that I also co-host another podcast, which is called Teen Speak, Empowering Today's Youth, along with my good friend Keith Senzer. Uh, he's a youth leadership and empowerment coach like myself. And our podcast is for teens, about teens and starring teens. And teens reach out to us to share challenges and struggles that they've gone through. But more importantly, the strategies that they've used to overcome those challenges. So if you know someone that would like to be a guest, they can go to Keith's website with the shiftyourpower.com or my website, coachteescorner.com. We have a guest form to fill out and we would love to have you on. And we've had some amazing young people on uh, as young as nine years old. And we've had some college students, uh, college athletes on as well. And they are very brave, encouraging, inspirational and motivating young people that we would love for you to be a part of that as well. So along with Jessica, thank you again so much and continue success. And I know that we will stay connected because I definitely want to follow all the success you're doing with your books and the impact that you're having on the next generation of leaders. Likewise, Anton, so great to meet you. And thank you for having me today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Enjoy yourself out there in Colorado while I stand the rain here in North Carolina. So <laughs> as always, I'm Coach T. I'm here to educate, support, and inspire the next generation of leaders. Until next episode, take care. Coach T's new book, The Ultimate Guide to Success for Preteens and Teens, is the perfect resource for preteen and teen personal growth and development skills. It breaks down in detail his SEA of Success program and its applications in 10 key development areas. The program applies Coach T's three key components, simplicity, effort, and attitude. It includes some of his success stories, as well as former and current student testimonials. Order your copy today on Amazon. Available in paperback and hardback.